Great. All right. Well, we have come to the final speaker, and I do not envy him his task. I wouldn't want to follow all of those great talks. I mean... Yeah. At least Robin didn't make me cry this time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we've got an amazing closing speaker. Um, I've known Aaron for over About a 10 decade years. now? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we go back a long way. Um, and we share a lot of ideas, I think. Like sometimes Aaron will write something and I'll be like, get out of my head, Gustafsson, like channeling. And sometimes he'll write a talk and I'm like, you stole that from my book? No. Yeah. <laughs> so we're kind of birds of a yeah, feather, yeah. going back a long way. But I think where, where Aaron's real talent lies is in, in teaching explaining and getting the, the bigger picture across. Um, so. And I'm particularly interested to see what Aaron does today because like me, he kind of shares a fascination not just with the future, but with the past and seeing patterns emerging over and over again. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for the final speaker of the day, Aaron Gustafsson. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, oh, good. All right, so first of all, I'd like to thank Simon because this conference has been awesome. Let's give a big round of applause to him. And, and thank, you, thank you to all of you for coming out and for caring because really, to me, that's what progressive enhancement is all about. It's about caring about the stuff that we do and actually looking at the web as a craft. And so that's really important. Um, and it's a great honor for me to, to get to close the first Enhanced Cloud. Um, so I want to start by looking at a, a Stack Overflow question that drew my attention last year, or, or an issue someone was struggling with. I've been trying to make my site work fully without JavaScript. However, I find myself in situations where I can't honestly think of how I would do some features without it. Uh, the submitter, Jamham, is certainly not alone in feeling this way. The ways we build websites change all the time. When I started out, it was pretty simple. We had HTML. Lots and lots of HTML. We also had Java applets and Shockwave and Flash. Then we got some very basic CSS and then some JavaScript. And as the years pressed on, the three major technologies that underpin the web, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, evolved and became more powerful. Things coalesced for a while in the early aughts before Jesse James Garrett posted this article rechristening a relatively obscure Microsoft technology, XML HTTP request, Ajax. And all of a sudden, countless designers started getting really excited about the prospect of not having to have page refreshes anymore. So at the heart of this revolution was, of course, JavaScript. And many companies began betting their entire web presence on its availability. Most learned this wasn't such a great idea and began making an enhancement rather than a core piece of the experience. But after Ajax, we had HTML5, CSS3, and a host of new JavaScript APIs, which got dubbed HTML5, not to be confusing at all probably the same people that gave us DHTML. Um, but then we had the JavaScript frameworks, React, Ember, Backbone, Knockout. Um, there are so many ways that we can create websites today, and they just keep changing. Sometimes that change is slow, but often it moves at a really speedy clip, and my head starts to spin, and I start to, to get a little bit crazy. And I'm not sure what I should be focusing on, what I should be learning next. Um, but the one thing that I've learned, being an old man in web terms, I've been working on the web for about 20 years now, is that web design is cyclical just like everything else. Right? The challenges that we face today building web products are not new challenges. And the challenges that Jamham was facing were not new challenges. They were things that we had addressed in the web 1.0 days. And recognizing how we fix those problems and how we address those challenges and those needs in web 1.0 uh, web pays dividends today because it helps us to, to create that baseline. Um, and it will create, it'll help us create great experiences in the future. So when I started out on the web, I had a 28.8 modem. But I had to support people who were on 14.4 modems. So they were operating at half the speed that I was. That may have been 20 years ago, but I learned lessons about optimizing my HTML, optimizing my images, and minimizing downloads that have helped me with high latency mobile networks. and awful hotel Wi-Fi. Um, and when I started on the web, I had an 800 by 600 monitor. I was very fortunate to have that size of a CRT. It was fairly expensive at the time. But I still had to support 640 by 480 screens. I learned the importance of prioritizing content long before we had Flexbox or media queries that allows it, allowed us to start to move things around. And while computer screens keep getting bigger, 
we're starting to see more and more devices move towards smaller and smaller screens that are way tighter than 640 by 480. And when I started out on the web, there was no JavaScript. All the calculations that we did, all of the dynamic stuff that we tried to do with our websites, we had to do on the server side. So I learned how to do Perl, and that was how I processed web forms. I later traded in my CGI scripts for PHP, Python, Ruby, uh, and so on and so forth. And while the majority of our users uh, have JavaScript baked in their browsers today, I still rel rely on those server-side fallbacks because I recognize that we don't control the execution environment. You saw this quote earlier in the opening talk. You're a savvy bunch, so I'm sure none of this is news to you. But I wanted to set the stage for what I'm really here to talk about, and it's something that Robin uh, has, uh, has hinted at and some of the other speakers have hinted at as well, and that's the cycle that's about to come back and hit us in, in the very near future, and that's voice. So science fiction has been a very strong predictor for our technological future. HAL 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey is probably the most infamous example of a computer that interacts with people largely via voice. Um, and as a concept, the talking computer has appeared time and time again in space age fiction, whether it be Red Dwarf, Interstellar, uh, and so on. To function in the real world, like they do on TV and in the movies, computers need two capabilities. Natural language processing, in order to understand what it is that we say, and then speech synthesis to communicate orally back to us. So, just like that. Um, natural language processing, on the one side, has its roots in the 1950s, but many of the speech models were really limited because they were all built around a series of hard-coded rules. And then in the 1980s, we began to have machine learning computers capable of doing machine learning, and real-time stati statistical analysis um, became possible. So it allowed us to, to develop better models. And as the hardware capabilities continued to improve and computers became more powerful, they got better at recognizing the words that we were saying to them, and eventually were able to assign meaning to those words so that they could begin to react to the words that we said. As the years marched on, the overhead required to enable this, this dropped significantly. Um, so listening is great, but as I mentioned, communication is bidirectional. Um, we humans began experimenting with speech synthesis as early as the 1700s, when there was a really creepy sounding vocal track, um, and then there were some other ones that were bellows driven and stuff like that, they're really weird. They were able, able to do vowel sounds. Um, but it wasn't until the 1980s that we got some decent results. And then in the 90s, we started to have reasonably intelligible text-to-speech, and operating systems began to roll out uh, these sorts of, of technologies as part of their assistive technology offerings, which became the screen reader. At present, screen readers are probably the best predictor of what the future of voice interaction looks like from a listening, from, from an us listening standpoint. And when combined, the ability of a computer to listen and then respond gave rise to the virtual assistants like Cortana and Siri and Alexa. And I believe over time, our customers are gonna become more and more accustomed to and reliant on voice-based interactions with their computers and with the web. We don't really have an instance where you can talk to Siri and have her read a web page for you, at least not very easily. You can have VoiceOver read a web page, but you can't get her to do it. Similarly, Cortana, uh, Alexa, they're, they're not there yet, but it's not too far in the future that we're gonna to start to see that. Um, and people are gonna to need to be able to complete critical tasks that they want to do on the web purely via voice. This also opens up a lot of opportunities from an internationalization standpoint because most of the web is written in English, but most people in the world don't speak English. And so being able to automatically translate that into their native language and allow them to interact via voice with our content is gonna be a big game changer. So how do you design a headless UI? That's easy. You actually design the conversation. This is another theme that's kind of been coming up time and time again during this, com com uh, during this conference. So let's take a little bit of a trip back in time. So one of the earliest computer games was Zork. Anyone here play Zork? A couple of you. Zork was written between 1977 and 1979. Um, it was a text-based adventure game that operates a lot like Dungeons and Dragons, like a, a desktop uh, or a tabletop game. Uh, with the, the computer, the program actually serving the role of the game master. So as you moved from location to location throughout the game, the program would describe the environment to you, no objects and people you could interact with, and you would type what you wanted to do and the program would tell you the results of essentially your role uh, to what you had, uh, had done in the environment. 
So as this was the early days of computer gaming, you might think that the interactions would be fairly mundane and, and simple, like noun verb combinations like kill troll, but Zork was actually more sophisticated than that. Its parser was able to understand far more complicated things, like hit the troll with the elvish sword. So lots of adjectives and, and other uh, connectors in there. So this made the experience far more natural as though you were playing it with a friend. So whether Zork or a web page, every interface is a conversation. We're engaging our users directly in an effort to inform them, to entertain them, or maybe to persuade them to act in a particular way. How this conversation goes directly affects the experience that our users have. So I'm gonna look at a couple of different kinds of, of web pages and interface components and sort of identify to you the sorts of conversations we might be trying to have in each. For instance, on a home page, we've just met. I'm trying to explain to you what you can do on my site, maybe even why it matters, right? On a contact form, you're asking me, or you're either asking me for something or you're telling me something, and I wanna be there to help you. I probably wanna set some expectations as to how long it's gonna take me to get back to you. That's generally a good thing. Um, on a product page, I'm explaining what something is, what a particular object or a service is, what it does, how it could benefit you, but as we were uh, hearing in, in the last talk, I should be showing you, not telling you. We don't wanna have salesy copy in there because people can spot salesy copy a mile away. Um, people are immune to that. And in terms of a status update, I may be prompting you with a question, but I'm here to listen. The floor is yours. Chances are I'm, I'm probably mining your data for marketing to you later, but <laughs> the floor is yours. Um, and when we approach interfaces as conversations like this, we humanize our products and we improve our users' experiences. When we don't, things can fall apart pretty quickly. I'll give you an example. Over the 2011 holidays, Facebook users were uploading photos like crazy. In the span of a few days, Facebook processed more photo uploads than are contained in the entirety of Flickr. Seriously, think about that. That's a lot of photos in a couple of days. One unintended consequence of this deluge of photo uploads was a significant uptick in photo reports. So people reporting a photo for, for some, some reason that it should be taken down. So Facebook received millions of these photo reports, but they made no sense. Moms holding babies reported for harassment, pictures of puppies reported for hate speech, and so on. Um, roughly 97% of the photo reports were dramatically miscategorized. So Facebook's, Facebook's engineers, they reached out to the people who had submitted these reports on these photos in, in bizarre ways to get a bit more background about why they had reported them. And at the time, their photo reporting interface provided a list of reasons that people could choose from. Um, but as Facebook discovered, many of these reports were made because people didn't want the photo posted for reasons other than those that they provided in that form. So in some cases, it was because they didn't like how they looked in the photo. Um, in others, it was because the photo was of an ex-partner of theirs, or maybe it was of a beloved pet that they shared with an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend. The, the existing photo reporting tool had not done a good job of accounting for these more personal reasons for wanting to have a photo removed. So the Facebook engineers went to work. They added a step that asked, how does this photo make you feel? The options were simple, embarrassing, upsetting, saddening, bad photo, other. Now the other option provided a free response text field to fill in if, if none of those options were appropriate for you. And with this system in place, they found that about 50% of the reporters who answered the new question chose one of the provided options. That was pretty helpful, but there was still a problem. 34% of the other respondents wrote it's embarrassing in the blank rather than choosing the embarrassing option provided above. What the Facebook team realized was that people weren't identifying with the embarrassing text, or they may, even, they may have even thought it was referring to them as opposed to understanding that there's an implied it's there. So a subtle, subtle shift in language was needed. So they changed the label to please describe the photo, and they updated the options to mirror how people actually talk. It's embarrassing, it's a bad photo of me, it makes me sad. And with the subtle change, they were able to increase the percentage of photo reporters who chose one of the options to a whopping 78%. So words matter. Even in something as mundane and banal as a form, the words we choose set the tone for our users' experiences and often have an effect on what they do 
or what they fail to do. So the text of our interfaces, especially form labels and, and responses, is just one small part of the content picture. But it's a perfect example of how easy it can be to overlook conversation in our interfaces. There are many other types of content, from product descriptions, marketing copy, legal statements, visualizations, all that sort of stuff. But content is where experience begins. We need to pay attention to it. It's the core that we seek to progressively enhance. It's also the foundation upon which voice-based experiences of the future will be based. The more time and consideration that we put into how our interfaces read, the better positioned we'll be to succeed in the future of headless UIs. Once stripped of your beautifully crafted responsive layout, your engaging animations and artful illustrations, does your site hold up? Back in 2006, Dustin Diaz proposed CSS Naked Day a day when sites could be stripped of their visual design and show off their content and their semantics and their organization. Design, as Dustin was referring to it in that quote, is the visual design of the site. But design is not solely concerned with visual representation as we often use it in that, that form. Diving into etymology for a little bit, design comes from the Latin word designare, meaning to mark out or indicate. The purpose of design is not to make something pretty, it's to clarify, it's to make something more usable. If the words we use form the basis of the conversations we have with our users, the semantics we employ clarify that meaning. Markup matters. Choosing the elements with semantic value enriches our content, illuminating the meaning and the intent of our words in order to overcome the limitations of text and bring it up to par with spoken language. After all, there's a big difference between these two statements. Beyond using markup to clarify the intent of the words that we write, we can use it to spell out the relationships um, that are represented visually. So Dustin described one way we do this in part of his impetus for CSS Naked Day. Um, in the spirit of promoting web standards along with good semantic markup and proper hierarchy structures. By proper hierarchy, he was talking about the document outline. The document outline is created through the use of heading levels. It provides an easy way to review the organization of our web pages and validate our source order decisions. It also helps us ensure that the flow of our web pages works, which is incredibly important in any conversation. It helps us get to the point to streamline our content and to remove distractions, all of which are a sign of respect to our users. None of this is news, right? Uh, content, strategists, content strategists have been recommending that we streamline our content since the dawn of the web. Sadly, most folks didn't heed this, device, or this advice um, until we came upon mobile. So suddenly, smaller screens required us to have focused content. And when Luke, Luke Rablewski coined mobile first, he used that as a, a way to tell us to focus on the core purpose of every page. In essence, he was telling us to focus on that conversation. Right? The approach of mobile first page pays huge dividends on small screens, but when it comes to voice-based interactions, the page doesn't really exist. Experience is the sum of each individual interaction that we have on that page. As part of their Alexa skills kit, Amazon offers a ton of recommendations for designing for voice, many of which happen to be useful for sighted users as well. Right, for people. We don't author content for ourselves. We author it for others, right? If what we write frustrates or alienates our users, we've failed at our job. In the, book, in the book Nicely Said by Nicole Fenton and Kate Kiefer Lee, they offer numerous suggestions for how we write with the reader in mind. Be clear, be concise, be honest, be considerate, and write how you speak. They also recommend that you read your work aloud. And as we head into the world of voice-based interactions, that's beta testing, right? When we're writing for Avoid our- technical and legal jargon. Sorry. Um, when we're writing for our readers, we also need to be familiar with their level of domain knowledge. Right? This comes back to the jargon thing, which, which was brought up earlier in the conference. We don't want to frustrate or alienate them. For example, if you track error codes or issues on your site, send them to your developers, not to the users. Never present this sort of an error message to a user. It's not helpful at all, especially if they can't do anything about it. Similarly, we should avoid legalese whenever possible. Medium's done a great job of this with their terms of service. It's probably one of the best terms of service. I actually thoroughly enjoyed reading it and read it start to finish. 
Um, and the one bit that they have that is legalese, they actually introduce in a very clever way, saying this is basically held up in American courts so much that it's actually got to be in all caps and has to be written in this very specific way. And we apologize that we can't write it in a better way, but here it is. And here's basically when what requesting saying. feedback, make it clear that the user needs to respond. So, in perhaps the most common form example, consider the label first name, right? It's not terribly conversational, and it also doesn't beg for a response. Labels like, what is your first name, make it clear that the user should respond. What's your first name? Add a text. Similarly, if there's an error, we should notify the user of the error, and if possible, give them clues as to how to fix it or why they should fix it. What's your first name? Add a text. Without your first name, I want to know how to address you. Could you please provide it? Again, conversational UIs. When asking a user to choose, clearly present the options. And per, oop, sorry. Um, this comes into play often when dealing with forms. Ensuring that radios and checkbox controls are properly associated with their labels is really critical to ensuring that our, our sites are accessible and that our pages will work in the voice-based future. Yes, radio button selected. You can use field sets and legend to group related form controls together, as I've done in this example. Um, but you need to make sure that the legend is actually focusable so that it can be read aloud. Because if somebody is just tabbing through the form, they won't actually get that legend content uh, unless you find some way to associate it with the, uh, with the radio controls or make it focusable, as I've done here with a tab index of zero. Do you agree to the terms of service for this site? Yes. Radio button selected. No. Radio button selected. We should strive for the same sort of clarity when presenting navigation options. The HTML5 nav, nav element enables us to semantically identify an area of the page being used for navigation, um, but it doesn't identify the nav element as navigation when naturally included in the flow of the document, at least not all the time quite yet. For that reason, it can be useful to provide some sort of textual introduction to that section, even if you choose to visibly hide it. So in this case, I have an H1, um, and it's got a class of hidden on it, and that would hide it in some accessible way, so it would still be available to the, uh, the voice, but not visibly displayed. Um, you might even consider expanding the text of your navigation um, to provide additional context, as I've done in this, this example as well. Um, so even though it says a bit about me, about is the only text that's actually visibly displayed in the navigation menu. Here's what you can find on this site. A bit about me. Entries in my notebook. So that becomes really helpful for somebody who is purely listening to the site. Prompts should be short while still being clear. So this is another quote that you've seen before. In a 1933 lecture at Oxford, Albert Einstein famously said, it can scarcely be denied that the supreme goal of all theory is to make the irreducible basic elements as simple and as few as possible without having to surrender the adequate representation of a single datum of experience. Or, as it was later paraphrased uh, by Robert Sessions, everything should be as simple as it can, but not simpler. Clear and concise writing is the hallmark of great content. We need to resist the urge to write for writing's sake because we write in the service of our audience, not of ourselves. Yeah. Even those of you that get paid by the word. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, government websites are some of the worst offenders in this area. So consider this lovely passage. Heavy rains throughout most of the state have given an optimistic outlook for less dan fire danger for the rest of the season. However, an abundance of lightning maintains a certain amount of hazard in isolated areas that have not received an excessive amount of rain. That's a, a mouthful. Um, it could be written far more clearly as simply, Heavy rains throughout most of the state have lessened fire danger for the rest of the season. However, lightning threatens isolated dry areas. Done. Lot, many fewer words, much easier to follow. So here in the UK, the government digital services make great strides in overhauling excruciatingly painful uh, forms and processes and just all of this content that's out there, making it easier to read, understand, and find. Um, one example is their overhaul of the accelerated possession uh, process, which allows landlords to evict a tenant. So this is a, a sample of the existing form, and I'll kind of read you out some of the, the salient bits from it. Um, the original paper form asked for an address like this. The claimant seeks an order that the defendants give possession of 
And in parentheses, if the premises of which you seek possession are part of a building, identify the part, e.g. flat three, room six, and seven, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and then they go on to request the type of property concerned, in parentheses, the premises, uh, which is a dwelling house or part of a dwelling house. So you guys all understand that. It makes complete sense, right? Um, the, the GDS went to work, and they went back and streamlined this uh, and, and put it in plain language. So what kind of a property do you want to take back? A self-contained house, flat, or bed sit? Room or rooms in a property? Tenants may share a kitchen or bathroom. They then allow you to look up the property or manually enter the address. Vastly simplified. And while not specifically designed for the future of headless UIs, this form is prepared for their eventuality. Ask only necessary questions. We show our users respect by respecting their time. Obviously, straightforward, brief writing is one way to do that, but another is to reduce the time it takes to complete a task. So many forms that we have out on the web are just brimming with fields that need to be filled in, um, in some cases, or, or that can be filled in. In some cases, the vast majority are purely optional. Um, and in many cases, for sighted users, it can be very easy to spot which ones are the required fields. If you're trying to bypass them using voice, it's very difficult. User experience designers have been pushing for simplified forms since, I don't know, well, as long, long as I can remember. Um, Users appreciate them. They tend to result in better data. They result in better conversions, um, way better than long forms. And when it comes to voice-based interactions, they'll become a necessity. No one's going to want to sit through 15 minutes of filling out your form just to put in their email address and choose a password. Okay? And yet, registration forms are just filled with tons of fields that marketing wants for statistical analysis, but you don't actually need. On a similar note, we should avoid slicing fields into multiple port parts if possible. For instance, you see fields like this one, um, asking for a US phone number, breaking up each of the three pieces that we typically do in the states uh, for a phone number. Um, but when interacting with this sort of a construct via voice, a user will actually have to supply three separate values. Right? You don't have the, that same sort of auto advance thing necessarily that you would have uh, in, a, in a visual uh, space. And even if you did, you would need to have each one of those fields labeled, and so the label would be read out to each one as you focused into it. And even in the states, most developers have no clue what the second and third pieces of a phone number are. They know area code, but they have no idea that the second part is the exchange or central office number, and then the line number is the third part. HTML5 introduced a bunch of new input types that consolidate complex things like phone numbers and dates and times um, into a single field. So use those. They're a great progressive enhancement. If the browser doesn't support that new HTML5 feature, they fall back to simply being a text field. And you can do some massaging of that data on the server side. Servers are really good at doing that stuff. And as an added bonus, most will enforce some sort of content validation and formatting rules on those fields automatically, with the exception of phone number, because there are way too many different formats. Present information in consumable pieces. So like computers, we humans have a finite amount of working memory. Right? The amount of mental resources required to operate an interface is called its cognitive load. But the amount of information that we need to process exceeds the capacity to handle it. We start to miss important details. We have trouble concentrating, and we become frustrated. We deal with cognitive load in GUI design all the time. But in voice-based interactions, we're not going to have visuals to act as signposts and reminders about what it is that we're doing. And that's why it's critical to break complicated tasks down into simpler ones and to eliminate excess noise, like non-required fields. We can also reduce cognitive load by chunking things like search results and other list-type content into small groups, asking the user if they want to hear more before presenting them. There's actually a really good article that came out in Smashing earlier this week um, that was talking about the load more versus auto, uh, auto adding search results, the infinite scroll, and which perform better. Um, so definitely check that out. So in paying attention to how our interfaces read, that's going to become critically critical to our success in the future of voice-based interactions. We already have a view of, con or we already, we already view content as the centerpiece of every progressively enhanced experience, but we can go further. 
So both Microsoft and Amazon have given us tools to voice enable our websites beyond the HTML that we present. Amazon's done this via a JSON API, uh, which they allow you to use to teach Alexa skills. So you can teach the Echo, the Fire TV, the new, I think it was it Echo Dash or Dot or something like that. Um, you can teach these new tricks that they can do or new ways of interacting with your website with being able to accomplish certain tasks all via their voice service, um, just using a JSON API to your site. Microsoft has taken a slightly different approach Using a relatively simple XML format, which I'll show you in a moment, they've enabled us to teach Cortana new stuff that then ties directly into our website. So in your website, you simply include a meta tag that points to that XML file, and that XML file contains the commands and variations of commands that will automatically be added to Cortana if they install your website as an installed app or a hosted app and Cortana will pick these up automatically. So those commands, when issued, can open up a specific page, or they can even kick off certain JavaScripts within your target page, which is pretty awesome. So we're just starting to scratch the surface of what's possible in voice and bringing voice to the web, but it's exciting to see how companies are beginning to address this opportunity. It's always interesting when things start to come full circle, and we see how lessons we learned early on on the web remain applicable no matter how much or how quickly things change. Seeing this pattern repeat time and time again is why I'm so drawn to the philosophy of progressive enhancement. It's not only concerned with supporting the past, it's setting us up for success in the future. Thank you. Thank you.